Welcome to episode 17 of Neopian Lore on the Lost Desert Plot. In 2005, an ancient temple rose out of the sand with the inscription, Kingdom of the Lightgiver, Mouth of the River. Entering the runes would lead users to a myriad of booby traps such as poison gas, flooding rooms, impaling spikes, and even an enormous blob of jelly. If navigated correctly, you would find a statue of the fire fairy Nuria. Whoever shall speak the prophecy here shall be rewarded with treasures beyond compare. So much intrigue, so much mystery, and much to be told. I'll try to be as accurate as possible and attempt to pronounce all names correctly, but keep in mind, this world is fictional and this is all just for fun. I'm your host, Krista Poyman. Now let's cozy up to some nostalgia. Many Neopians still don't know that far to the south of the haunted woods lies the Lost Desert. Even fewer know that in the heart of the Lost Desert stands the magnificent city of Sakhmet, a thriving town in an ancient and timeless land. Sakhmet is home to exotic pet pets, amazing food, and some of the best entertainers in the land. But the most magnificent thing in Sakhmet is the royal palace where Princess Amira watches over everything. A far cry from luxury, the streets of Sakhmet team with beggars, scoundrels, and villains, including a gang of wily street urchins known as the Desert Scarabs. One thing about Sakhmet, you can guarantee it is never a dull place where unexpected visitors can arrive at any moment. While the opening may be reminiscent of Disney's Aladdin with thieves running rampant, a princess staring longingly out a palace window, and a shady figure, let's get one thing straight. Princess Amira, the beautiful desert Aisha decked in a flowing white dress and wearing gold and lapis jewelry, is running the show and is no nonsense. There are a few times she is referred to as a spoiled brat, but she is far from it. She will not bend because someone tries to manipulate her. And that doesn't make her a brat, only that she holds strong with her convictions. Amira may have the title of princess because she's not married, but she is acting as queen. I would also like to point out her TCG card description. Yes, this plot had a corresponding Wizards of the Coast set, and the cards are stunning. That says, beautiful, cultured, and rich, Amira always thought she'd have the pick of men. As you will see in a few moments, she clearly demonstrates she has no intention to marry. Granted, it seems none of her previous suitors have ever bothered to actually get to know Amira, so that could be part of it. But according to this card, there was a time in her life where she wasn't disillusioned. Or maybe taking care of the kingdom became top priority. So to start our story, like many before him, Prince Jazan of Kwasala came to the palace to try and woo the princess. While she's in an important meeting, mind you, and Amira doesn't take it kindly. Let me guess, prince of who knows where. You are here to ask for my hand in marriage. You shall have the same response as all the other suitors. No, I will never marry you or anyone else for that matter. You go, girl. How dare this guy come waltzing in while you're preoccupied and has the audacity of asking for marriage within the first few sentences? Prince Jazan refuses to take no for an answer and presents an ancient text, supposedly of their marriage being prophesied. Amira does not care and has the guards drag him away. Jazan yells out, You will regret this. You are legally mine. I will be back. The princess has her advisors look into this prince and his city, Kwasala. She is informed, Kwasala was a thriving city with a well-respected royal family. The whole city was obliterated in a terrible sandstorm over 200 years ago. I'll give this imposter some credit. He did his research, 
but he is no match for our records. We flash over to two thieves, Nabil and Tomos, a part of the Desert Scarab's gang. Nabil is a pink ixi with pink and purple hair and pants, crop top, and a veil. She is sarcastic and brave, but also follows her heart. Tomos is a red loop who wears blue hair and pants, white shirt, red vest, and a tiny red hat. Tomos puts on this front of being this big, brave, tough guy, but he truly is a big scaredy cat. Nabil usually being the one to lead the charge. The two have fantastic banter and know when to joke around or be the other's support. They decide to follow the furious prince, who rode off into the desert on a blue uni to try and nick something off him. They follow him to the ruins of the city Kwasala, but the prince is nowhere to be found. With nothing to show for their troubles, the two friends head back to Sakmet, though they are unaware they're being watched by Jazin whose eyes glow red as he mutters, It won't be long before they become my royal subjects, when the princess is mine and the prophecy has been fulfilled. Patience, my friend, she will not refuse me again. One way or another, we will be wed. Ugh! Creepy, 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 creepy. As stated at the beginning, users had to solve a series of puzzles within the runes of Kwasala to complete a stone tablet, given to them by a fortune teller. Each person's temple was different, with 450 doors and around 90 rooms, so it was advised to draw out your own map so you wouldn't bang your head against the wall. The fortune teller also provided clues for places to visit around Neopia to gain scrolls that corresponded to symbols on the temple doors. Once the tablet was completed, you deciphered the symbols, which were eerily similar to actual Egyptian hieroglyphs such as the Eye of Ra and the symbol of Ankh. Users also needed to find the statue of Nuria, the fire fairy, within the runes. You'd be given a two-line poem, and depending on your text, it would give you clues to which door it was behind. For example, thunderous clouds obscuring the sky, meant black, mouth of the river meant triangle, so your particular door would have a black triangle on it. That being said, it wasn't that simple. There would be 12 doors which fit that criteria, so you would have to try each one out until you found Nuria. And of course, you would get locked out for a period of time for every wrong answer. Once you finally did find the statue of Nuria, you would utter the prophecy given from your tablet. Suddenly, a bright light would shine from above, and a secret panel would open. You'd inch closer to your prize to find... a pile of scarabs. I promise we'll get back to the puzzle portion in a bit, but as a side note, Nerea's design is so cool. She's the only Neopian fire fairy with literal fire wings. Ugh, and her dress intertwined with gold jewelry is so gorgeous. She needs a reappearance on the site, not just as a statue. The only other time we've seen her is in the game Neopets Puzzle Adventure, which was on the DS and Wii. Not many people have really heard about it because it's basically a phone app on a console. Quick shout out to the PlayStation 2 game, The Darkest Fairy, which actually had an awesome plot and fantastic music. That's how you make a tie-in game. Alright, back to Sockmint with the comic. Nabil and Tomos go back to their usual shenanigans with their gang of stealing from merchants. But guys, real talk. If you're gonna take things, don't steal from the working class. Steal from the rich. Did we learn nothing from Robin Hood? After they're done, the thieves are chilling, eating their stolen goods, and contemplating how to steal from Prince Jazin. But Jazin is acting on his own plan. As Princess Amira is about to make a big announcement to her people, he interrupts. Forgive me, my lady, for once more interrupting your affairs. I see you have assembled your citizens to welcome me. Very well. I am honored you wish to introduce me so quickly as your husband-to-be. I will never wed such a foolish impostor such as you. There is no city of Kwasala. I don't know who you are, but you are not welcome inside these city gates. Guards? Princess, you will regret dishonoring me. Before they can seize him, Jazin transforms into a powerful sorcerer. 
His blue uni becomes a night steed, skeletal and wrapped in bandages, flames kissing its feet. As the guards pull Princess Amira to safety, like a boss, she still says, You will never frighten me into marriage, you fiend! Amira sees Jasmine as someone who will only want more and more. If she placates him through marriage for her people, he'll want something else soon after. Oh, but then they would be safe. It's just a never-ending cycle. Of course, her refusal doesn't bode well with him. Since you refuse to let me join your world, then you must come to live in mine. With his powers, Jazen transports Sakmet into an alternate dimension, filled with the undead. During this whole crazy ordeal, though, completely oblivious are Tomos and Nabil outside the city. They watch as the city of Sakmet fades, then disappears. Gone. Poof. Tomos tears up, distraught with how they had just lost everyone they loved. Nabil comforts him, saying they will find them again somehow. But for now, they must seek shelter to rest. They follow Jazen's tracks back to the ruined city of Kwasala. They fall asleep, but in the middle of the night, a noise awakes them. They quickly put out their fire and peer to see who has come. The night steed, its red eyes aglow searching for them, its bandaged, undead body cast in silhouette from the moon. They pray that the night steed won't find them, but a scarabug whizzes past, startling Tomos. Being heard, the thieves retreat further into the runes, and the uni follows after them, calling out, There is no use in hiding, little ones. I will find you soon enough. Am I the only one who is shocked the night steed can talk? Since they're quadrupedal instead of bipedal, I thought we were going to go animal versus humanoid rules. I don't mind it. I was just surprised. I know you are close. I can smell your fear. Nabil steps on a lever, opening a trap door, and both thieves fall beneath the runes, either to their deaths or their saving grace. Puzzle time! Users needed to head over to the scroll repository. But what's this? Another obstacle? Two guards stop you. Only licensed contractors are allowed into the repository site. What's your business here? Depending on the symbol you found on your Nerea statue, See, the scarabs were just a red herring. You had to pick the perfect lie, such as, I'm the food receptionist for your herbivore workers. Or, I'm here with the royal census. You're not a rookie, get out of my way. If you were allowed in, your prize was to be put to work by the foreman, slowly uncovering a golden pyramid, hauling golden blocks with symbols on them, and furnishing the place. What a, what a great prize. And what could be missing from the scroll repository? The, the, the scrolls. Those, those are pretty important. The, those were also added. So the repository was completed, and a secret staircase appeared, which led to a map room with a model of Sakmet City. For three hours a day, random for each player, sunlight shone into the room. Players had to collect crystals from areas around the Lost Desert, and when the first few were placed within the model while the sunlight was out, it would project colors that corresponded to different scrolls, leading to the remaining crystals. So when all four crystals were placed, kaboom! The wall behind you exploded, and there was the ultimate scroll. But you couldn't read it. Bummer. But the fortune teller could. Mm, yes, I see. Aha, of course. This is in an ancient dialect of Sakmetian, and I think I recognize it. I believe it says, well, there's a lot of nonsense up front, but finally it says, the curse of Jazin will make Sakmet disappear, which is an awful lot like that prophecy you found before. But then it continues, Jazin must marry a true princess of Kwasala to break the curse. That explains why he wanted to marry Amira, but she's not a Kwasalan princess, is she? I wonder how we'll pull that off. Ooh, the mystery continues. Let's see if the comic illuminates its meaning. Back in Sakmet, they are battling the undead, as there is no escape since the city is surrounded by a terrible sandstorm. 
Princess Amira is instructing her troops, but Jasmine says the only way for it all to end is through their marriage. Princess, I do not want to have to do things this way, but I have no other choice. You have one week to decide, or I will let these creatures rip your city apart. Others have started to question Princess Amira's choice, going as far as to call her a spoiled brat, which is so rude. You honestly think the guy who trapped them all in an undead realm wouldn't go back on his word? Seriously? Meanwhile, the desert scarabs in the undead realm try to come up with their own plan. But as they cannot come to an agreement, they begin to argue. Quite loudly. And the undead find them and launch an attack. The desert scarabs quickly dispose of them, and as they traverse the streets to find safety, they learn the monsters have poor eyesight, so moving slowly is key. And if they do get caught, all they need is a hit to the head with a blunt object. Ah, yes. Utilizing zombie rules. The desert scarabs tell the general and princess the news of how to defeat the undead, and hope is restored. Also, I just love that Amira didn't question this ragtag group of scoundrels. They could have easily gone the, how can we trust you, route, but luckily they didn't. And what would they have to lose, anyways? Everyone is trapped in the same horrible situation. Jasmine watches as Sakmet successfully fights back. Not interested in defeat, he sends his two-headed Scorchio to torch the city. Amira confronts Jazin. Is this what you want? To rule a city in flames? To marry a princess who despises you and can't stand to be near you? You have no idea what it is to live like this. Okay, okay, maybe we're gonna get some vulnerability from him. Come on, come on, express your feelings. This is insanity. The only thing you've offered my people is death and misery. Only if you deny me. Take this ring, Amira. The moment you put it on, you will be my wife and the torment of your people will end. And there it is. Manipulation is not the way, Jazen. But with Sakhmet in flames and no other choice, Amira concedes, and preparations are underway for the royal wedding. Back in the ruined city... Tomos and Nabil aren't faring much better. They are faced with the same traps users dealt with, flooding rooms, spiked floors. But as they find safety, they come across an armory, which Tomos explores, and a library where Nabil investigates, and she finds a fascinating story. Once a noble prince, Jazan of Kwasala was struck by a terrible curse. One night, his entire city was transformed into a thing of nightmares. His people became monsters. No one was spared. Jazin was doomed to live a tortured existence until he weds the princess of Sakmet. When true love unites, Kwasala will live again. Oh, so maybe if Jazin would have told Princess Amira this, explaining his situation, she may have been a little more sympathetic to his woes. But being in the realm of the undead for 200 years would probably do a number on one's social skills, so... I'll give him a slight pass. After hearing this story, Thomas retorts, <laughs> Sounds like a load of mushy rot to me. Nabil expresses she feels bad for Jazen. She understands why he is so desperate to break the curse. Tomos mocks her, making kissy faces. And then shares what he finds more interesting, a collection of rings. One is stated to take the bearer home if lost, so immediately he starts trying them all on. Before Nabil can stop him, he puts on the Ring of the Lost, and they are transported to the realm of the undead, and immediately captured by palace guards and separated. Nabil tries to coerce her guard, saying she understands Jazin is not all evil. All she wants to do is talk with him to put an end to the curse, as the tablet says, the curse will only be lifted when true love unites. It's clear Amira would never love Jazen, hence the curse would not be broken if they were to marry. The guard decides to help her, putting Nabil in a presentable dress, one of the old Kwasalan queen, to address him. Nabil rushes to the palace, and the royal wedding is already in progress. As the preacher says, if anyone knows why these two should not be married, let them speak now. Nabil butts in with, I do. The prince does not love Amira, and she absolutely hates him. Smooth, Nabil. Super smooth. Jazin is peeved, but 
What's this? Oh my goodness! Nabil just so happened to stand in front of a portrait of the previous Princess of Kwasala. And she just happens to look just like her. A royal advisor explains, A long time ago, Princess Nira brought her family to shame after she fell in love with a simple peasant. Her father cast her out of the palace and left her to live in poverty with her husband. Not only is Nabil a descendant, she's also Princess Amira's distant cousin and of royal blood. Nabil grabs Jasmine's hand and says, I have read your story, Jasmine, and I know you were once a kind prince. Deep down, I believe there is still a good heart inside you. This wickedness is the curse. It isn't you. Amira may not love you, but I do. I can't help but laugh at this scenario. She literally fell in love with him because of his tragic backstory. Only the idea of him. It's not even the cliche of love at first sight. Jazen releases Amira, who I'm sure has been loving this turn of events, and instead marries Nabil right then and there. The moment he placed the ring on her finger, the city of Sakhmet returned to the world of the living, and the monsters vanished. Nabil returned to Kwasala with Jazen as her husband, and together they began rebuilding the kingdom. Over time, Nabil and Jazen's love continued to blossom, but still, the curse had not lifted. Jazen is distraught. Why has nothing changed? I did exactly what the prophecy commanded, yet my people remain monsters and my city lies in ruins. And then we finally see a compassionate side of Jazen. My dear, I know this is not the life you imagined. I cannot bear to see you in this doomed place. I beg you, return to Sokhmet where you will be among the living. Okay, I do love a good redemption arc. Nabil says she can't imagine leaving Jazen, but after long talks, she agrees to return to find an end to this dreadful curse. Nabil arrives in Sakhmet and is thrown a hero celebration. She reunites with Tomos, which if I was him, I'd feel a little rejected. She kinda just abandoned her best friend to marry the big bad guy. I get that it was literally to save Sakhmet, and perhaps he saw it as a noble sacrifice, but still. Then a storm arrives. No, not a storm. A creature made of bone and flame. Hello, Sokmet. Prepare to meet your doom. Long ago, you imprisoned me. Now, thanks to my foolish son, I have been free. I am Razul, the most powerful sorcerer to ever live. Dun, dun, dun. So the prophecy wasn't meant to break Jazen's curse, but to release this imprisoned sorcerer. He cast fire throughout the city, Sokmet yet again in fiery peril. This was where the Battle Dome portion came into play. Users had to fight the Spirit of the Runes, Scordrax, that two-headed Scorchio from earlier, and Razul himself. Razul's starting hit points were a whopping 100,000, compared to 50 and 150 for the other opponents. I applaud anyone who managed to beat him, cause sheesh! In Kwasala, Jazen refuses to eat, causing him to become weak and lose all interest in rebuilding his city. He thinks of how Nabil must be so much happier among the living and sinks further into despair. But then he senses his wife is in danger. Without a moment to spare or a morsel of food, he mounts his night steed and heads towards Sakhmet. Zooming back to Sakhmet, Razul the Sorcerer corners both Princess Amira and Nabil, determined to end the royal bloodline. Just at that moment, Jazen arrives and realizes his opponent is his reincarnated father. Razul spouts, You pathetic lovesick fool! You are an embarrassment to me! Ouch. Definitely some parent issues here. But we have no time to waste as he builds up a spell. Foolish child, I should have killed you years ago. But when he fires at Jazen, Nabil jumps in front and takes the magic instead. Jazen finds the strength and magic inside him and fires back at his father. No, it cannot be! He implodes into ash and smoke, and as he dissipates, the sun shines on Sakhmet once again. The curse is finally broken. Nabil is weak, but alive. All she needs is some rest. The final panel shows Jazen and the Night Steed walking into the sunset. The Night Steed seemed to remain in his undead form, 
but they seemed not to mind as, I'm rather used to looking like this now. And with that, the plot was over. Users got a fancy new trophy and prizes depending on how many puzzles they solved and how well they did in the Battle Dome. Quisala was safe under new leadership. Always compassionate for the less wealthy, Nabil has created a name for herself in Quisala as a just and kind queen. She has also made more than a few enemies at court, however. And short-tempered and skilled in dark magic, King Jazen is not to be trifled with. Life in Quisala is pleasantly dull and quiet, at least for now, and King Jazen and Queen Nabil rule their people with wisdom and justice. Though Jazen possesses many dark spellbooks in his sandstone palace, he keeps the library locked, lest any thieves find themselves tempted. And in Sakhmet under Amira's rule, it has become a peaceful, thriving, law-abiding place. As Amira puts it, terribly boring. Whenever she gets a moment to herself, the princess longs for some excitement to come her way. Well, that's all for this episode of Neopian Lore. All characters and licensing belong to Neopets.com. Music was created by me, Krista. Today's composition is called Sands of Time. I hope you have a lovely day in Neopia.